Good morning, church. We're going to start with worship here, so if you can make your ways to your seats. It is amazing to see you all this morning. We just want to encourage you guys to get ready to worship God in heaven. We're going to all do it together. It's going to get us ready for an amazing week. But we're going to be doing everything in Jesus' name this morning. I'll raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. I'll raise a hallelujah out of the empty unbelief. Raise a hallelujah. Raise a hallelujah. Our weapon is a melody. It is a melody. Come on, church, sing that out. I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. And heaven comes to fight for me. Heaven comes to fight for me. I'm going to sing in the middle of the Yeah. 
She'll be coming up and sharing her testimony as a part of the communion. And back. You get to hear from one of my favorite speakers, and that is none other than our very own George Uzakis. George is ready. I can tell you that. He was telling me before we started here. Uh, we're, we're, it's a spiritual battle that we're in, and we are. And with that, I want to pray because we've got some needs in the body here. Uh, this week, our brother John Hood lost his brother. Yep, after a bat, long battle with an illness. And uh, then uh, Sabina Quinn lost her stepdad. And then most of us know that Jack Vandergriff, he's had a rough go here. He's in uh, rehab, but let's... Continue to be praying for uh, these individuals as well as many other needs, but let's all pray together Set our hearts and minds as we continue in our worship Father we're so humbled that we can come before your mighty throne of grace and father that Jesus is seated at your right hand and God just all the ways that you have prepared us for life and godliness so that we can know you so that we can have a relationship with so that, God, we can come together as brothers and sisters and worship you together. God, thank you so much for your son. And as we take time to remember him this morning, and God, the way you've changed all of our lives because of his body and blood. God, thank you so much for the way that uh, we not only get to worship you this morning, but we get to be encouraged and inspired by the word being preached. And I pray your spirit will be with George and use him. And God, I pray that the fellowship will be rich and that we can encourage each other. And God, life is so difficult at times. And, and Father, I know 
We're here for a brief moment and we're reminded even this week. And I pray that you'll be with John and his family as they grieve the loss of his brother. And God, I just pray your angels, you wrap your arms around them and that we can wrap our arms around John and the family. But God, I pray for Sabina. You'll be with her with the loss of her stepdad. God, I pray you'll continue to be with Jack, strengthen him. But God, we're so grateful that Jack, I know God, though the flesh fails, it counts for nothing. The spirit is thriving in his heart. So God, I just pray that you'll bless every aspect of the service today so that it glorifies you, lifts you up. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. 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 So we're going to transition into communion. You know, when we think about communion, I think something I want to remind us of, because often we'll have somebody come up, like we're going to do this morning, and hear from Maria, and people will give their testimonies. And how does that tie into communion? I think the way it ties in is that because of the body and the blood of Jesus, because of the greatest act ever committed on this earth in love, because of what Jesus did on the cross for us, the decision that he made, our Father planned it. There's so much embodied in the death, the burial, and the resurrection that does one simple thing. It's changed all of us. And so when anyone comes up here and shares, they're, changing, they're sharing about how the body and blood changed their life. Because that's who we are as disciples, because of God's love, God's mercy, God's grace. So this time as we listen to Maria, let's remember it's because of the cross of Christ that her life is changed. Amen? Amen. to thank you for letting me share and Joe, Jimmy asked me to share because there is something in my life, the biggest thing that I was a prisoner to that God um, delivered me and rescued me. Um, and the only reason I can be up here now is because he delivered me. I was so, so incredibly shy that literally to be able to physically be up there, up here like this in public speaking would be an absolute impossibility. And I still feel in my body I'm shaking, my knees are shaking, I feel very nauseous, but because of God I can actually be here. Um, and he gave me deliverance about 35 years ago, and at that time I promised him that if I ever was asked to share, I'd say yes, because how could I say no when he gave me the ability to do. So when Jimmy asked me, I said yes. I, it's not pleasant, but I'm here. Um, so um, here's how Jesus rescued me. From as long as I can remember, I was painfully, painfully shy, like imprisoned from it. Um, I think if I was a kid now, I would be diagnosed as a selective group. Um, there were certain situations it was absolutely impossible for me to speak. If I was in a social gathering with more than like two or three people, public speaking, um, any new social um, situation, I was, I was a mute. I can remember going, and I apologize if some of you have heard my story before. Um, I hope not to bore you. I hope I'll bring a few extra things in. But I remember in nursery school, I couldn't engage with the kids. I couldn't participate in the school. I sat on the perimeter and maybe said the words in my head to the song or maybe did a hand motion next to me, but I could not engage with the other kids. Um, all through school, I was the quiet, shy kid. Couldn't participate. When I got to high school, I knew I was stuck and I was absolutely miserable and I started doing some therapy. I read a lot of books, I did personal growth courses, all to try to help me overcome this and break out of the prison, but I couldn't. Um, then I went to college, and um, even in college, you know, the, the routine was people would knock on your door as they were heading to the dining hall and ask, like me and my roommates, if you want to go for dinner. So if someone knocked on my door, I'd go. But if they didn't, 
I couldn't ask anyone if they wanted to go to dinner with me, and I never could enter the dining hall alone, so I just wouldn't eat. I'd just skip meals because I was too shy to actually go and eat. Um, and I was hungry. Um, I made a deal with myself in college every semester that, you know, one deal was I will talk to one person in this class sitting next to me or behind me. I will say hi just one time, or I will raise my hand and I will make a comment once. And, you know, every time the end of the semester would come and I'd look back and think, okay, I didn't open my mouth in any of my classes. I was just, I was trapped. And um, I got married right before my junior year of college and my husband had some co-workers at work so we were going to have uh, three couples over for dinner and I really thought this is my chance to meet some women and to make some friends. So I had the house all in order, spent a lot of time planning the menu. I was so excited. And um, we had the people in, there was laughter, everyone was talking. And when they left, I realized I hadn't said a word. I had guests in my home and literally for the time they were there, I did not open my mouth. And I thought to myself, Maria, you are condemned. This is going to be your life and you're not gonna be able to get out of it. Wow. Um, at the same time in college, I, um, I was invited to church. And I was interested in going, but I couldn't because fear had a hold on me. The woman who invited me invited me to church in Boston, and, um, and she was a black woman. And I thought, I can't go. It's most likely a church of mostly black people, and so I'm going to go, and people might know that I'm a visitor, and someone might come over and talk to me. And the thought of someone recognizing me as a visitor and coming over and having a conversation was more than I could bear. So I said no. But um, God was working and he was after me and there was a Bible discussion group in my complex that I went to and I studied and became a Christian. Um, and I was comfortable in the Bible talks and the small discussion groups, but when I went to church, I couldn't engage and I couldn't talk to anyone in the fellowship and I was married at the time, so I just clung to my husband. Um, and you know, I'd nod and smile and laugh in the conversations he was in, but I couldn't speak. And then about two or three years after we were Christians, he had some health problems and couldn't go to church. And so I was going, and then one of my good friends who was also discipling me, I just glued myself to her. And after a few weeks of this, she realized that there was a problem. <laughs> and she was the first person who really looked at the root of my problem and challenged me, and she challenged me that my shyness was rooted in self-focus and self-centeredness, and I'm not saying that's what everyone's shyness is rooted in, but that was, she was right for me. I was so self-absorbed thinking, what are people gonna think of me? How am I gonna come across? What if I say the wrong thing? And just all focused on me that I couldn't speak. So she helped me with challenges. Like my first challenge was go to church and say hello to one person. Then it grew to two people. And then maybe, you know, after a while, we'll say hello and maybe ask someone how, your day, how their day was. And she was helping me to just start thinking about other people instead of myself. And I'd really have to pray, let me just focus on one person, think about them, think about how to encourage them. But that's God's way. And that was how God delivered me from um, just that constant self-absorption. Wow. Um, <clears throat> sorry, just a sec. Um, so that was 35 years ago. And now, you know, if people know me now and they didn't know me then, they wouldn't know that I was just so chained. But, um, but it still affects me now. I can still feel those tapes when I'm going like to a new social situation, like a bridal shower or something, um, or like today. <laughs> I can still feel the fear coming up, but I can pray about it. But I had an interesting thing last week. I feel like God is still um, helping me um, and help me see and help me to have freedom from Satan's claws because he's still after me. Uh -huh. And um, this week I was going to a, uh, a Bible, to, a Bible, no, a book talk, a book club. And it was my first book club ever, so I didn't really know what to expect. Um, and I was feeling excited about it, but 
on, my, on the way the old tapes started going on in my head. Yeah. You don't know what to say. What if you say the wrong thing? What if you can't communicate? What if you can't articulate your thoughts? And on and on and on. And I can feel myself just pulling in thinking, I'm going to go in this book club and I'm not going to be able to say a word. And um, it, was, it was a book club on a really powerful, deep, extremely challenging book. Um, and it I was feeling very, very raw in what I was going to be sharing, and very emotional. Um, I've been doing some anti-racist work and some a lot of self-reflection and excavating. And, um, and then I do it to, personally and then and sometimes get together with the community and talk about it. So this was kind of an extension of that work. Um, and I was praying, God, help me. What do you want me to know about this at this time, why is this coming back? You know, what am I feeling and how do I how do I deal with this today right. in this moment because I'm going to the book club now. Um, and God showed me that it's just a way that Satan's getting me. I want to be able to have all my words perfect and choose the right words and articulate myself and be able to really express all these difficult emotions that I'm feeling in the right way. And so my thinking is I won't speak until I can do all of that in my head and then I can speak, which would never happen. Um, God reminded me of the Peter and John when they were really bold and people noticed that, but they were ordinary and unschooled men and God gave them the words and God just told me, go in, share your heart, be humble, and he'll give me the words to say. So um, I had a great victory that night too and that's just how God has delivered me and then continues to deliver me from um, my imprisonment. So thank you. Yeah. So what you're looking at here is a changed woman. No, you don't understand. You don't understand the miracle of how God has molded this woman to be who she is today. Uh, she inspires me. You, you don't understand how much she's had to persevere through in the course of her walk with God for decades now. And I say that to you because that's the power of the cross. And if you're sitting here this morning thinking, I can't change, I'm trapped. Don't, don't listen to Satan's lies. She's a testimony. And I'm telling you, you haven't been through as much as she has. I challenge you, if you think you have, meet her in the foyer and talk to her. I'm serious. I'm serious. Don't, don't let Satan chain you. And, and I asked her specifically to share this morning because I'm not kidding. Her walk with God inspires me because of how much she's persevered and overcome. And I can't thank Maria enough for sharing this with me. I think that's what happens is we see, you know, different disciples come up here and they share. By the way, she's got to go back to Kids Kingdom because she's serving. <laughs> wrap this up in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 18 Paul wrote for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing see to the world God the Bible Jesus and what Jesus did on the cross makes no sense but to us who are being saved it is the power of God down in verse 22, Jews demand signs, Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jew, Jews, foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. The power that enables us to change is from God, but more specifically, it is found 
at the foot of the cross. In the cross, we find God's love, mercy, patience, forgiveness, power over sin. Those are the ingredients necessary to conquer sin. Why? Because the enemy, the devil, accuses us night and day. And God wants to set us free. And this power enables us to persevere, not only overcome, but then as we overcome, as we live for Christ, one day at a time, we not only become stronger, but we build character. That's why you're looking at a changed woman. Why? Because of the blood of the covenant. Jesus' blood, precious blood, the blood of the lamb that was shed, innocent blood, for those who are guilty, and that is us. That's how much God loves us. His body was crushed for our sins, but the good news, it was resurrected. Amen. And because of that resurrection, we have hope because we put our faith in that body and that blood. We don't have to fear. We can eagerly await our adoption as sons and daughters. So as we take the bread and the cup, Remember where the power comes from. Remember who you are, but remember more importantly, who Jesus is and what he means to you. And let's decide to recommit ourselves this morning to Jesus. That we walk out of here changed because of our recommitment to what Jesus did for us on the cross. Let's pray together. Father, we're so, so humbled by what Jesus did for us. At just the right time, when we were powerless, when we were just enemies of the cross, your son died for us. And I pray as we reflect on his body and blood at this time that we'll not only examine our own hearts, but that it will humble us of how unworthy we are. And yet, God, you still lavish us with love, grace, mercy, and most of all, God, forgiveness. Yep. And I pray that we will recommit ourselves to leave this fellowship this morning to give our hearts fully in commitment to you and to Jesus because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.
morning, church. This is the uh, time of the service where we uh, take up contribution. If you give online, simply go to our website, northeastbcc.com, click the giving tab. You can also mail out a check to the BCC office in Framingham. Just put in uh, Northeast Region in the memo. And uh, we're pleased asking to, if you can, to make up any missed time from the summer. And as we uh, pass the trace, join me in prayer. Father, we're so grateful for your son. We're so grateful for the transformation that you allow and you invite us all into, Father. Thank you so much for the opportunity you give us to continuously choose you. Thank you so much, God, for the many talents that you've blessed this region with, God, to help us all to focus in on you and, and draw near to you. I pray that it is out of that heart of gratitude that we give this morning. We love you. In your son's name we pray. All right, as the trays are being announced, I got some uh, announcements for you. Today is the All BCC Family Group Leaders Meeting in Arlington. Okay, if you are a family group leader, I want to encourage you to go to that. If you are thinking about becoming a family group leader, if you at one point were a family group leader, I want you to consider going to that. We're coming up with thinking about a lot of different changes that we can make, especially in the coming year in January, to redefine, to refocus, to redistribute talent, guys, so we need your help. So if that intrigues you, and if you're interested in that, I want to encourage you to come and uh, just participate in what we're all doing together uh, as, uh, as a church, as the BCC family of regions. Amen? You guys with me? Does that sound exciting a little bit? All right, good. Good stuff. For midweek, we're going to be uh, here at Parker. Men and women will be broken up into classes, and the title is Jesus Conversations with People. So September 27th, Wednesday, here at 7.30, uh, my wife and I will be doing uh, separate classes for the men and women. This is what I'm really excited for, this next assignment, all right? And I can't even go to it, okay? It's the women's service, all right? We've got invitations for it. A lovely Kate, our co-insert, came up with it. Doesn't that look amazing? All right? And, and again, it's the speaker that excites me. All right? She's extremely brilliant. She's so smart. She has a way of doing like ninja counseling on you without you even knowing that it's happening. Right? It's like, it's like silent ninja and you walk away and you're like, I feel refreshed yet challenged at the same time. Right? You, you can't miss this. You can. We have invitations for you guys out there. Please grab a few, pass them out to your friends. She's an amazing woman of God. I don't say those things because she's my wife. All right? So just come out, support this. Maria and her have been working so hard to give you guys something that you can walk away feeling proud of. Amen? Amen. This, our Sunday service, we're going to be broken up into sectors next week. It's a neighbor day. So I want to encourage family group leaders to try to organize some food for us, amen? So by your, by your sectors, we're gonna be doing this. Uh, those in North Shore are gonna be here. Those uh, in uh, Merrimack Valley are gonna be in, at Haverhill High School, 10 a.m. <clears throat> North Shore specifically, bring enough for the campus. They might appreciate that. Uh, I don't know, maybe. And I'm sure uh, Merrimack Valley, you got, come on, Homar. Homar's hungry. You got one who's hungry. One campus students. Amen. Now, listen, bring your friends, bring your family. We're going to try to do something different and fun uh, next week. All right, now Vaughn Hickman has a squad announcement for us. Come on, Vaughn. Come on, Good morning. Good to see you again. It's been uh, a minute and uh, bigger fun. Uh -huh. This is just a reminder to the members of the Last Minute Church of Christ, uh. as has been the case with each workshop today, 70 to 80 percent of the registration is complete during the week before the workshop, which starts in 13 days. Please contact me if you have any questions. Uh, this is uh, for everyone afterwards, they would describe a life-changing event. Their perspective has changed along the lines of red pill, blue pill. This is something that everybody really needs to go through, and I encourage you to... Uh, join us in the workshop. Thank you. I like that one. Last minute Church of Christ. Ain't that the truth? That's the truth. No, we've done the training ourselves. It's so good. If you haven't done it already, please, please, please come talk to, talk to Vaughn. You will not regret it. 
Uh, we have an EMS video now that we're going to show before we have a special announcement by Doug. Since we moved to Poland, we prayed a lot about Polish people to come to the church and about this vision about Poland. And it's becoming a reality this year. For some time already, our church services are being held in Polish with translation. Also, we provide Polish classes for the disciples who want to be more fluent in Polish and for their friends. And this way we can see how we are becoming the church, the Polish International Church of Christ, that can embrace Polish people and people of any nation that live in Poland. So we are raising our contribution and the disciples are making various creative projects to raise money so we could afford this new bigger hall of the church. In Warsaw in particular is a center of uh, international travels for Europe. Also there are many universities so young people from around the world are coming to school just to have uh, their degrees in in Poland and Warsaw. We also see how important it is to have Polish international church in, in our country. Then we had COVID times and God amazingly worked through this period and we got more people who want to be baptized and they came back to the church. Now we're worshiping God on Sundays uh, and we sing in four languages, English, Polish, of course, uh, Russian and Ukrainian. So now we have disciples to use their gifts for the church, like having painting workshops for couples at our marriage event, or baking for our fair, for the camp, when we raise money for the camp. And now we have more house church leaders. We have a satellite church in Butch. There were eight people there, and now we have 20 disciples there as refugees. So the church is healthier and it's growing. As a church, we are grateful for support of uh, European Mission Society, specifically Chicago Church of Christ. Over the years, we are receiving a lot of support from you, especially this year. Since we only had 10 children, and five of them were the age 10 to teenagers, we encourage disciples to send their children to other camps. But now, with the group of refugees, we have so many children, so we had to provide the camp for our children. And we are very grateful for all the support we got with this camp from European Mission Society. We believe God will continue to work powerfully in Poland. Thank you so much for your support, and please pray for us. I'm kind of excited about this. Doug has a family church announcement. Amen. Come on, church. Yesterday, the Santa Cruz family and the Sharon family had the joy occasion of witnessing our son, Kevin, ask their daughter, Emily, to be his bride. Parents, our goals are to raise our children in the Lord with hopes that they will have a solid foundation so that they can build their lives with. Amen. Yesterday, we got to see that with our own eyes. We're thankful for this village that has helped us build with them with precious stones. So to God be the glory. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Amen. If we could just now stand up for another song before George Muzakis comes and preaches on unwanted presence. Amen. Amen. And actually, before we say, remain standing, before we sing, let's go to God in prayer. Amen. Father, we just come to you quickly and ask you to prepare our hearts. Open up our hearts, Father, so we can receive your word. Open up our hearts, Father, so that we can connect with you. Be with George, fill him with the Spirit of God, so he can preach what you want us to hear. In your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 Let's go, worship. Let's go. 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 Let's go.
doesn't take a trophy to make you proud. I'll never be more loved than I am right now. Oh. Going through a storm, but I won't
Vader did a great job last week talking about the uh, rich man and Lazarus. And um, what a powerful story, right? But he was battling the mic. Word of God in one hand, like an action hero. And the mic in the other, that action. That's it. But um, what's such a great uh, theme that we've been working on, working through. we will find the uh, clicker here. You know, we've been talking about Jesus with the people, and, and we're going to be continuing that through the fall. And if, you know, you're visiting for the first time, it's just such a powerful, to me, it's just such a powerful message. Because Jesus just had a way of interacting with people in just such a powerful and inspiring way. Have any of you seen the show The Chosen, the series The Chosen? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's powerful, and, you know, a lot of it is seeing Jesus ministering and ministering to crowds and moving around and just doing great things. But for me, some of the most powerful moments of watching The Chosen is just seeing Jesus interact in a really intense way with somebody. Yeah. You know, you see how he treated people. You see how he loved people. And you see the power he really had and the ability he had to help people to change. Ruth, is this? Is it on? On the side? There you go. Today we're going to be talking about an unwanted presence. You know, as we, as we see Jesus and we see the way he interacted with people, you see the way he treated people and loved people, you know, it inspires us when we see it written, but then what we do is we, we need to take a leap of faith. And we, and we believe that Jesus, the same Jesus, is alive today. Yeah. He's here today. He, he interacts with us in the same way. Okay. You know, Colossians says that, that Jesus, the Son, is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn over all creation. The idea is when you see Jesus, you see God. You know, this week we're going to be in Mark chapter 5, verse 1 through 20. And we're going to read an account of Jesus' interactions with a very troubled man. It's a unique encounter because in the story we're going to be talking about demons. Okay. We're going to be talking about an exorcism. I mean, this is a dramatic story. Yeah. And it's a big story. But I think there's a really powerful message for us. Because, you know, there's troubles in our world. There might be troubles in your life and troubles in your home. But the message of this story, I believe, is there's a power in the world that's greater than all of those. Come on. And I'll be honest, there's some, there's some challenging concepts in this passage that we're going to read. You know, I've read it hundreds of times over the last 28 years that I've been reading the Bible. And I still scratch my head wondering what some of it all means. So before we jump in, I wanted just to take a moment to set the table for Mark chapter 5. You know, Ephesians 6.12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the, of the, dark, of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You know, guys, we don't wrestle. Our battles, our fights aren't against flesh and blood. Your battles and your struggles, they're not against your boss. Right? Your battles and struggles are not against your neighbor who's going to be blowing the leaves in your, in your yard this fall. It's not against the people who have the wrong political sign that you disagree with in their yard. You know, the battle isn't even against yourself. It's something, it's something bigger than that. There's rulers, there's authorities, and they're organized. Right? They're organized. And it's a, it's a reality of our existence that many people don't really give any, any credence to. You know, it, it's irrational. It's not good water cooler talk to talk about the spiritual world, to talk about the fact that there's good good forces, which a lot of people can get their minds around, yeah. but there's also some evil forces out there, and they're organized. Yeah. Mm. 
it's hard, it's hard. You know, you tell people that, they probably think you think there's a, you know, the world is flat as well. It just seems so archaic, a thought. You know, on the flip side, there's, there's some people that I think kind of over-spiritualize everything. They don't appreciate the world, the physical world that God created. And that we're still very, very much a part of it. You know, many of us would scoff at the idea, if we were sick, not to go seek medical attention. Right, that would seem crazy. Just to pray. I mean, some people do that, but I mean, some of us would think, even as Christians, that's kind of crazy. But many Christians don't understand still how mental health can impact how you're, how you're feeling and doing, or the impact of you know, somebody's family of origin, or even the impact of systems of injustice and what they can do uh, to just you know, somebody's well-being. You know, the natural and the supernatural play off each other, and they impact one another. And that's, I think, guys, really one of the big, big concepts of today's passage. Your physical health can have an impact on your emotional health. But your, but your physical and emotional health can also have an impact, I believe, on your spiritual health and well-being, yes. and vice versa. Yes. So what we're going to do today, the opportunity we have, I believe, is to be able to look at the spiritual world through maybe spiritual virtual goggles, virtual reality goggles. Okay. You know, Maria's story, Jimmy said when I was coming up, that couldn't have been a better segue to your sermon today. I was like, you got that right. You know, there's, there's, some, there's what you see and hear in Maria's story, but there's also a lot of spiritual, there's a spiritual reality to that story that yeah. we're going to look at. I think this passage in Mark 5 gives us a look into that. Now, it's 20 verses, guys. It's, All right. it's 20 verses. So we're going to work through it. Mark chapter 5. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an, impure spirit, with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. The man lived in the tombs. And no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had been often chained hand and foot, but he tore the, tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? Mm. My name is Legion, he replied, for we're many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The, be the, the demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs. Allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the impure spirits came out of them and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When, when they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had, who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. He became an unwanted presence. Hmm. As Jesus was getting to the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let, it, let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and all the people that were amazed. Mark calls it a new... Let me get it out. Can you guys hear me okay? 
Mark calls it an impure spirit. Luke said he was demon-possessed. Either way, this guy's in really tough shape, and he's really scary, right? Luke says he went around naked, like an animal, right? He's not ashamed. There's some, he's so far off, like shame has left him. He was crying out night and day for his deliverance, but nothing could set him free. I don't know if any of you guys have been to the Grand Canyon. My family and I went a few years ago. Well, when you sit on the, you know, the rim of the Grand Canyon after you have your panic attack, <laughs> which I think I did, yeah. you look out and it's just so big. It's just so much to take in, right? And the only thing you can do is just start focusing on a couple of places and just to really start to ground yourself. You know, guys, this is a big story today. There's a lot to take in. What I'm hoping we can do is just zoom in. Come on, George. Okay, we're going to focus on two big topics today. Number one, who is this man that Jesus heals? We've talked about him, we've read about him, you've read about him probably for years. But who is he? What can we learn about him? And what does this story, what does this account teach us about Jesus? So who is this guy? He's uncontrollable, but what's interesting to me is he's not in jail, right? I mean, he's, he's living in a pretty brutal world. He's not living on the, the Jewish side. He's living on the, the you know, the, the, the capitalists. It was run by the Romans. All that we know about them, they're just pretty brutal people. And what's strange to me is they don't, they don't ever eliminate him, right? They just seem to kind of try to deal with him, not effectively. They tie him up, he breaks out. They tie him up, he breaks out. And it makes, it makes you wonder why. Like, why didn't they just deal with him? You know, you, you wonder, we don't know, but did this guy have a family? Yeah. Did, did they know him? Did they remember who he was before he became the demon-possessed man? Yeah. Did they have some kind of, like, you know, I don't say not sympathy for him. I don't think they felt sympathy for him, but they couldn't just go that, that extra mile to, to eliminate him. You know, it's easy to to dehumanize this guy because he seems like a wild creature, but he was somebody's child at one Come point. On. <clears throat> right? We talked about the demon possessed man last week in early communion in the kids' class. And we looked, you know, we thought about it. Kids coming in. You know, he he was a child in kids' kingdom one, at one point, right? He was a child, maybe one of the active children, but he was a child. He had a family. He had a name, right? Before he became the demoniac, he had a name. It makes you wonder, how did he get, how did he get to this point, right? Yeah. He was cutting himself. You know, a lot of you know that I'm in the mental health field, and I've thought about that. You know, why do people cut themselves? You know, thinking about this sermon, I did a lot of research and listened to a lot of accounts of people who have gone through a really difficult time in their life and experience where they, they harm themselves. And I and listen, I don't want to make any statement or send any message that if you hurt yourself, you're demon possessed. I don't believe that's true. But it certainly suggests the vulnerability. Something's going on, there's pain. And I I listened to all these accounts of people that, that hurt themselves. And it was interesting, as I did it, certain themes jumped out to me. They expressed pain, but it was different. You know, when you lose somebody, that's a deep emotional pain. And, you know, and that's, and that's hurtful, it could be tragic. But it's a little bit different than this pain. This was like social pain, if I can, if I can sum it up. You know, people describe, as listening to these videos, are people describing them just not being happy with themselves. You know, you're not happy with your, yourself, maybe your body, the way you look, your height, your hair, your lack of hair, maybe your gender identity. And you look around and you see other people in the world, and they look so happy. And you realize there's just, you feel there's just something flawed about you. That was one story. Another was just, just deep shame. Deep shame. You know, there's something embarrassing, so embarrassing in this person's life. 
either that they did or that happened to them, that it's just, it just is unspeakable, it becomes just so isolating. Feelings of being reject, rejected or neglected. There's, you know, when I listen to these stories, there's just something about themselves that they just hate or despise. You know, and people cut themselves as a remedy, and, it, uh, and for all accounts, it seems to provide some relief. But like any destructive pattern, it becomes addictive. And in any, you know, any relief it causes in the moment, because it distracts you from the greater emotional pain, you need more, and you need more of it, and more of it to get the same impact. And your life becomes full of turmoil. The question I thought about was, what about mental health issues? Maybe this guy just needs some meds and a good therapist. What else is going on? You know, but you know, first of all, as I thought about that, you know, if you've been around the mental health world at all, you know that there's no magic pill that can fix somebody. Anybody who, who sees any lasting growth or change, it's usually a lot of things that are going on in their lives at the same time. They're learning skills, they're getting help with their medical issues, they're putting their life back together. And you know, it's so important, because we have to remember, you know, we're physical and spiritual beings. And some questions that we ask ourselves and we struggle with, I think some of them are in the physical world you know, dimension, and some of them at their core are spiritual issues. I've worked with people that have trauma, that have gone through a lot of trauma in their lives. And you can help them work on emo, you know, regulating their emotions, <coughs> reaching out to the right people, coping skills. Like You can help them with those things, but inevitably, the question always comes down to, why? Mm. Like, why did this happen to me? You know, guys, at the core, that's, a, that's an ex, you know, existential, spiritual question, right? Because you can't start answering the question why. Whenever you start having that conversation, really soon afterwards, a conversation about God ensues, right? It just seems to come and flow. Substance abuse, too. There's a lot of good work that counselors and therapists can do with, with helping people with substance abuse issues. But at the end of the day, you know, 12-step programs seem to really help people because part of one of the steps is you have to take accountability and make amends for your life. Right? That's a spiritual issue. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, it's just so important because we can get so confused in our in society and thinking, you know, where are, and where are their answers? But the question is, like, what is the questions that we're asking? What is the questions as an individual we're asking? You know, Jesus in John chapter 5, you know, he's walking through uh, Jerusalem. He sees a bunch of people at a pool. And they're all people that have medical problems. Some are invalids, some can't walk. And he sees a man there that, he's, that he hears has been there for 38 years. 38 years. We don't know how he got there, but he's paralyzed. And what happens is, Every time the water is stirred, there's a superstition among the group that somehow if they get down and touch the water, they can be healed. And he sits there hoping and hoping and hoping for this remedy that the world's going to give him, and it never comes. And Jesus sees him and walks up to him and asks him, do you want to get healed? And he heals him. But then he finds him later. And he asks, and he says to him something really profound. He says, stop sinning. Or something worse will happen to you. Yeah. Stop sinning or something worth, worse will happen to you. It makes you ask the question, did this man's sin cause him to be in that state? And if that's the case, if I'm suffering, I'm going through a hard time, either physically or emotionally or my family, did my sin cause it? And that's a really desperate place to get. What we learn in John chapter 9 is, that our, our sins, God doesn't work that way. God doesn't work that way. God, you don't do something and God punishes you like that, but sometimes God does give people things. People he trusts, he gives them troubles, where, where hardships, and in the end, it's a way to bring glory to him. Amen. You know, our circumstances 
can lead us to a dark place. And even if our physical body or mental state doesn't change, it can, it can really, uh, our, our, our spirits can really be, be hurt. Come on. You know, Luke chapter 11 is a really interesting verse. Jesus talks a little bit about the, the, the spiritual world. You know, a lot of people are saying, hey, you're driving, out, you're driving out demons and you're doing it by demonic forces. Which Jesus says, that just doesn't make any sense. How could Satan drive out Satan? Right? He, he kind of debunks that. But he, but he says this about the spiritual world. He says, you know, when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I'll, re I'll return home to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. Mm -hmm. So here's this spiritual world we're trying to get our minds around and, and trying to understand. We learn a little bit about it here. You know, we learn that demons are looking for a home. And they can team up. Some are more wicked than others. And the impact of them, of some person, a person's life can get worse and worse. But there's an interesting law of nature, I think. When, when there is a vacancy or a void, something's going to fill that up. Yep. It takes energy to keep something maintained and well, in, well, in good working order. If I park my car in your driveway and I leave it for, there for a week, it might get a little bit dusty. If I leave it there for a month, maybe the tires will start to deflate. If I come back 40 years later, <laughs> that car's not going to be in good shape, right? It's just things don't get better if you neglect them. If you've been to my house, we have, you know, in, in the back, you know, I've got a, I've got a, in my backyard, there's a, there's a barn. There's not my barn, but there's somebody else has a barn. And there was an, there was an elderly lady, lady living there for many years, and she passed away in a house, not the barn. <laughs> but as she, as she passed and her family didn't come you know, by to really maintain the property, guess what happened? It started to fall apart. Yeah. Barns falling apart, houses falling apart, grass growing everywhere. And then guess what comes next? The critters. There was a family of foxes. And moved into the house. They were like under the porch. Nobody's there. Nobody's there to claim it. Now, I've got an electric fence around my yard, and I've got two dogs. And it was really funny because, like, the fox knew just where, how far they could, dogs could go. And my dogs would be bark barking at the foxes, and the foxes would be barking back. It is a weird sound, the fox bark. But it was crazy, but they, they wouldn't come into the yard. And although, you know, maybe a fox would run by once in a while, in the yard once in a while, and once in a while they'd even see a coyote, my, my, my land is occupied, right? But if I didn't occupy my land, what would happen? Maybe that fox is in there. You know, some people do such a, an incredible job. We can do such an incredible job kind of taking care of the... the the appearance, the surface of things. You know, we can we can look all swept and, and clean, on the and on, on the outside, right. on the outside. Some of us can be incredibly successful. We can be in incredibly good shape. I, I even <laughs> Some of you are great athletes, and, and your houses even look great. They look great. Yeah. Your pets listen to you. I mean, like you got it all together. But if the inside of the house mm. is vacant, you know, it's just, it's, it's just not going to work. Help us. How did Jesus bring this guy back? What did he do? How, how did he bring him back? How did he reach him? He asks him, what is your name? You know, it's just so important to separate our identities as children of God from our sin and brokenness. It's so, so important. In The Chosen, you know, there was a scene where somebody was not doing well and, and, and he was asked, you know, what's the name your mother gave you? Just to kind of ground him and bring him back. Yeah. 
You know, our battle isn't against flesh and blood. You know, I, I've done a lot of marriage counseling over the years. And one thing I've realized is couples get better when it's not about each other anymore. You know what I mean? Like, you can talk about one another, but when it's, when it's about how bad the other spouse is do, doing, excuse me, or what, what they're doing, what they're not doing, those couples really, they really spin. You've got to externalize the problem to get somewhere, right? You've got to talk about a dynamic that happens. Because if it just becomes about flesh and blood, nobody ever gets better. You know, a lot of us, you know, when you, when they, you want to describe yourself, they go, oh, describe yourself. Well, I'm, just, well, I'm an introvert. How many would say they're an introvert? You know it's going to be the wrong answer if you raise your hand. <laughs> say, I'm an introvert. We say, I'm insecure. I don't have to, I mean, I so much appreciate what Maria said. She was so confident, but expressing some of the things she struggled with. But it's an amazing phenomenon that what we think becomes what we believe. Yeah. You know, you're a child of God. You're beloved. You're owned by Him. You know, insecurity might pop up in our brains, and, and you know, introversion might, might pop up, and we might struggle with that. But when we start believing we're anything, we become that thing. My wife got me a, got me a, a mug. I love this mug. I'll let you get your mind around that. My wife got, gave me a mug and she gave it to me one day. She goes, this reminds me of you. I want you to look at that and think, is that a compliment? I, I, Questionable, right? <laughs> but what you think about becomes how you feel, becomes who you, it becomes who you are. Yeah. Right? And I, I hope that the mirror maybe is Jesus and what he thinks about yeah. us, right? right? That's probably a bit of better parallel. But it's, it's a powerful truth. Yeah. Bringing in for the land for landing guys. <laughs> who is this guy, Jesus? What happened? You know, Jesus goes, you know, the, the story before Jesus getting on to the meeting the demoniac is that he was on the other side of the lake, he sails over, and there's, there's wind and waves, there's like a hurricane that, that a squall comes up, and he calms the ocean, and the ocean becomes calm, and they sail, and they sail to the other side, and once they land, this guy approaches them. And he heals them. He heals them. And then the pigs. And then, and then the, the crowd and the town. And they have an uproar. You know, it, and I think it's really a story that's supposed to... We try to get our minds around, but we've got to get our hearts around, too. It's a big story. I love in The Chosen, you know, there was a, there was a scene where a, a demon-possessed man was, was cast out. Not this one, another one. And the, the, the disciples were wrestling with it. That, that demon-possessed man was wrestling with the disciples and being really violent. And Jesus comes around, and, and Jesus isn't there, of course. But Jesus hears the commotion, and he comes, and he, he gets on the scene, and he just deals with the demon-possessed man, and is gone. And everybody's sitting there, and it's, it, they, they all just get kind of silent, like, what just happened? And then the, then the, the John the Baptist character in the show... He just goes, yeah! <laughs> like, yeah! Like, I mean, that's just your reaction. Like, yeah! You know, like when the Patriots came back 28-3? Yeah. <laughs> Gonna go there again? It's just like, yeah! Like, you know, my team, my guy, he can do anything. <laughs> Not anymore so much. That's where this, this analogy breaks down a little bit. But imagine it's, it's dusk. And you're one of the disciples, and it's been an insane 24 hours. Everyone just starts drifting into their thoughts as you're sailing back to the other side of the lake. And you're, you're doing what people do. You're trying to make sense of what you've just seen and heard. How do you make sense of it? I, I don't think they made sense of it, to be, to be quite honest with you. I think they recorded it, but they spent a lifetime making sense of it. I mean, Jesus showed up on a foreign land like a conquering army. Yes. It's incredible. 
and you get off, you know, you back home, and you, and you go to your house, and your wife, you know, your Peter, let's say you're Peter, right? His wife and his mother-in-law meet him. And he real, they realize that like, he went over quickly to the other side of the lake. Something must have been urgent. And Peter gets home, and his wife and mother-in-law want to know, like, we're like what, what happened? And Peter describes it. He describes how you know, the demons submitted to them, to him. Yeah. Like we were so freaked out, he had it under control. They're wondering, like, what are you doing here? They don't know the whole story. Demons don't know the whole story. You know, we, we think the, you know, the spiritual world is more powerful than us. Yes, it's not more powerful than God. God is omnipotent. God, God is all knowing. God is all present. Demons aren't all knowing. They're not all present. They're limited beings, just like you. And then there's their, their Lord, who's this, this omnipotent being that just takes control of the whole thing. You know, and she, and then you're Peter, you're describing this to your, to your wife. Imagine just trying to get your mind around that. Mm. But it's interesting. Like I'm, I'm just imagining again. We're, we're imagining, right? Tell, you know, Peter tells that story to his wife, and then his wife turns to him, takes it all in, and is like, wow. But then, after thinking about it, says, but what does it all mean? What does it all mean? What did you just, what you just told me, what does that all mean for me? And I want to ask you guys, we read the whole, the, the whole account. I wish we could have a, more of a discussion here. This would be a great discussion question. But what does it mean? Think about it for a moment. What does it mean? I think what it means, I mean, this story tells me he can do anything. Yes. Yes. If you thought something along that line, like he can do anything, raise your hand. That's a lot of you, right? He can do anything. There's, no, there's nobody he can't touch. There's nobody he can't reach. There's nothing he wouldn't do to help somebody in need. Yeah. And you can imagine Peter just sharing that, and that conviction, that belief, and that commentary. But maybe he, he thinks and he pauses for a moment. But there's a caveat to that. He's trying to put words to it. He's trying to think it through. There is something that he can't do, as hard as it is to believe. He can't help people who don't want to be helped. He won't force his way in. I mean, that's just, he just won't. They asked him to leave. He's arrived like a conquering force. He lands there. They say they're not happy with it. They're worried. He leaves. Jesus isn't going to force his way into anyone's life. You've got a choice. You've got to give Jesus the, the keys to your house. He was an unwanted presence. He healed an unwanted presence. He healed a notorious man. But very quickly he became unwanted. I'm looking at the time. We're out of time. I've got like three other points. Maybe Jimmy will, maybe Jimmy will uh, invite me back. I really appreciate what, me, what Maria shared. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a power of what Jesus can do. It's the power of a changed life. I was going to share my story, but I think it's just, that's a great illustration. Maybe your story isn't exactly like Maria's story. Maybe you, know, maybe you didn't go through something as significant in your life. Maybe you went through something more significant. Maybe it's not as significant as what the demoniac dealt with. Maybe it is, maybe it's less. But the story is, the punchline is he can do anything. With his strength, we can do anything. Know about you, but I feel very fed this morning. Um, I just want to thank George for not only digging into that passage, but making it real, 
spiritually. Um, I will say this, George, if you have more, I'm going to invite you back. So. <laughs> How many of you would like to hear the rest of that message? So, you and I are talking, it sounds like, and, uh, you know, the, um, the women's service, we're going to have a men's service Saturday the 14th of October, and then the women's. Uh, Carrie Delgado has maybe one of the most powerful stories you'll ever hear. You want to invite family, friends, anyone that's been through a lot, God will use this woman to help them. We have invitations out front, and I want to ask all the ladies, guys, if you want one and you want to hand them out to women at work or whatever, feel free to grab them, but this is primarily for the women. I just ask you, whatever you grab, they're in stacks of 20, make sure you put them to good use. We're also going to send out electronic uh, invitations for you to send out to family, friends. But it's going to be a powerful day. So those are, as you're walking out on a table there, I do want to say thank you one more time to George for his message this morning. Let's all stand up. We'll have this closing song. Have a great day. Have a great fellowship. Love you all. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn to love.